What's up, everybody? Jensen Cummings here. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. Today is Best Served Podcast 253. We're talking farm to bottle in craft brewing with the one and only Jeffrey Stuffings. Jeff, great to see you. Likewise, Jensen. Great to see you. Thanks for having me on. Usually we are joking about it. Usually we have uh, big beers in Breckenridge to be the place that we get to commiserate every year. Unfortunately, that's not happening. And we see a lot of that across, you know, especially this summer. It was really hard missing out a lot of those festivals. And you're omnipresent at those because not only do you have a brewery and are a brewer and are a business owner, you're also very much somebody out there who's looking to speak on the ethos of what you believe is the opportunity and potentially the responsibility for a brewery to be within its community. And I want to talk about that a lot. The way that you've gone about creating a sense of place there in Texas and what that really means and how we can be thinking about that. Because if it's only what's in the bottle, what's in the glass, craft breweries are vulnerable, right? They need to have a depth of connection and story. And that's what I want to get into. So give the seven people watching who have never heard of Jester King. Give them a little background. What can they expect from Jester King? Sure. So we are located on a ranch uh, and a working farm that's uh, outside of, uh, of Austin, just right on the doorstep, uh, uh, outskirts of Austin. And we were founded, co-founded my brother and I in, in 2010. And um, as you mentioned, you know, we try to create a community out here, uh, both through agriculture, through brewing, through uh, cooking, uh, through events, um, you know, craft beer. When we started in 2010, there were about 1,500 breweries, and now there's over 8,000. So, wow. to, to your point, yeah, you can't just make good beer and, and hope to get by. You have to combine it into an overall experience. You know, I think one of the positive things in in craft beer is that breweries have become more and more neighborhood centers, community hubs, places that that build you know, cultural fabric. I mean, I think beer, what's best about beer ultimately is that it brings people together to experience, you know, humanity. You know, I'm guilty as anybody of, you know, spending, you know, many hours a day, like staring at a screen and, and that's fine, but there needs to be that balance with, with community because uh, ultimately, you know, that's what, what we are as, as humans, we're, we're social creatures. So, um, We've tried to establish that, um, you know, it starts with with making, you know, good beer. But again, like we said, that's just a prerequisite. Yeah. From there, I think for us, it's combining it with uh, really good food. We, we keep it simple. We specialize in, you know, wood fired pizza and uh, and, and baked uh, baked goods. Um, and then from there, just try to have really just thoughtful, thoughtful sourcing that supports, you know, our own local farm here at Jester King, as well as just. Uh, growers within about a you know 25 mile radius of the brewery um and then also uh we've tried to grow as much of our own uh produce uh for both you know, our own restaurant as well as uh our beer making um we have a, a nascent vineyard a, a fruit orchard um, we have livestock we have um, we raise Amazing. goat uh which we're getting close it's not going to be this year, but, um, you know, hopefully by 2021, we're starting to, you know, install um, the equipment necessary for a commercial dairy. And so. Um, wow, Jeff, that's amazing. I did not yeah, know about that. Yeah, we, uh, our farmer, uh, uh, Peppy, Sean Peppy Myers, I mean, he uh, brought just like six mother goats to us like three years ago. And now we have about 30 goats in our, our herd, uh, normally like two birthing seasons. So, um yeah, but again, you know, going back to the roots of your question, we're just trying to create community that's thoughtfully tied to, as we like to say, time, place, and people, where you're taking the intersection of um, our location, the people who are here doing their work, and the season in which we create to make something that can only exist within the cross-section of those three variables. Um, just trying to be a little bit of a bulwark against, you know, commoditized agriculture, which, you know, tries to make essentially everything one size fits all the same yeah. no matter where you go. And so trying to have like color and originality through uh, focusing on a sense of place. Then you're, re then you're removing yourself from the equation of being commoditized because that's happening in 
a lot of industries, food and beverage, especially you see that right now, and craft beer specifically, as you mentioned, the massive boom in 10 years from 1,500 to 8,000 is massive. The only way that that market can sustain itself is if there is differentiation and distinguishing within that market. I think that's important. So you're both creating this ethos of creating that sense of place, of really focusing on the people and the time, the community and all that. And also, it's a smart business tactic, very practically, right? Because if it's just your hazy IPA or your Saison or your Kettle Sour or any other beer, somebody else can outcompete you. They might have more money. They might have a better location, right? And then you fall victim to so many of the things in business that a lot of food and beverage entrepreneurs and operators fall into. Yet for you, nobody can ever have the same experience anywhere else. That I think is what I really wanted to hover on and make sure people understand. You have to make sure that when people walk in your doors, whatever that is, open the doors of, of a cooler at their, at their local bottle shop. When they interact with your brand, be it in person or at any touch point, it has to be completely unique to you that they cannot, nobody else can recreate that experience because if they can, they will, they will steal it and they will do it. And you see that play out time and time again, where people are just hype chasing a beer style and trying to make the exact same beer and be like, our beer is as much like everyone else's beer as anybody else. And that's what you guys have gone the opposite direction. So thank you. I wanted to rant for a second because I think it's important and we don't talk about it enough and you talk about it all the time and I want to make sure that people listen. Now, I want you to break down uh, the beers that you're actually making because you also take a very different approach to the beer itself and we're going to throw some big long terms up here, but I want to think about uh, mixed culture fermentation, spontaneous fermentation and sour beer. These are very misunderstood in the market. Their value in the market is misunderstood as well. So I want to break that down. So where for you does that start? Spontaneous mixed culture for you? Where does where does that conversation start? Oh, I would I would say maybe maybe mixed culture. Um, yep. And really, you know, I define that as just anything beyond you know pure culture brewers yeast. You know, brewing goes back somewhere between ten to twenty thousand years, and for the vast majority of that time, it was all mixed culture. And, and what does mixed right. culture mean? Just like different types of yeasts as well as bacteria uh, that would be in the fermentation. I mean, some of the first brews were done by simply letting, you know, unfermented beer, you know, wort, essentially uh, sugary water that has been, you know, bittered by, you know, various types of plants to just attract wild yeast that's just everywhere in our environment you know the yeast is out there it's practically on the skin of of, of all of the living world yep. and it'll so find out sources of fermentable sugar and convert that sugar into co2 and alcohol um so for us you know we just try to be a brewery that focuses beyond the world of pure culture brewers yeast not that there's anything wrong with that whatsoever sure. You know, pure culture brewer's yeast, uh, science is advanced. You can take a single yeast that's going to produce the same consistent, predictable flavors over and over again. And that has really given you know, rise to not just craft beer, but just, you know, brewing on a global industrial scale where you can make beer through pure culture fermentation tastes practically the same every single time. And that's that's wonderful. Um, but, you know, going back to my previous answer about wanting to have that sense of place, that uniqueness, that tie to time, place, people, a huge part of that is relying on nature for fermentation. You're doing natural fermentations that use yeast that we capture from the air or the land. Maybe we culture it off of wildflowers. Maybe we harness it from the air using a, a device called a cool ship. Uh, so we kind of have that, that uniqueness from batch to batch, that variation, that natural variation. Um, there's a big crossover, I think, with with uh, you know, mixed culture fermentation in the beer world, as well as with you know natural wine, um, where you're just relying on right. microbes instead of pitching like a, a wine yeast that's going to produce like very consistent, predictable flavors. You're just relying on the microflora on the skin of the grapes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just venturing beyond the world of cultured brewers yeast is kind of at the heart of what we do. Yeah. So I think there's kind of three different ways to look at it. And for you, you're thinking about the way that you're interacting with the yeast, the microorganisms that will facilitate the fermentation. So, right, you have you have lab grown, which is very consistent. You know exactly what you're going to get. You know exactly how to control that fermentation. So it's it's repeatable, which 
there's a lot of value in that absolutely for creating a consistent business. And so that is one methodology. Then you're talking about spontaneous fermentation where you're literally unaided. You are basically open fermenting. You have a cool ship in your barn there that basically whatever naturally occurring microorganisms are going to find their way from the natural environment onto that beer, they are going to facilitate that fermentation. And then also mixed culture or wild is a little different where you're not taking the lab grown, but you are harvesting and then you are inoculating with wild yeast. So you kind of have three different methodologies there when it comes to the way that you're going to create the catalyst for fermentation. People need to be thinking about that because each of those has a different process and expectation, a different outcome, a different value as well, because the time and effort that it takes to create what you're creating is significantly more and higher. And so I want to go into sour beer. Jeff, what the hell is sour beer? I, I mean, most simply, I would say, you know, any beer with kind of perceivable acidity and, you know, you can go about creating that acidity in, in multiple ways and, you know, kind of queuing off of what you mentioned with time, there's, you know, a very quick way. And then there's a more long-term pronounced way. Um, you know, the quick way would be just, you know, for instance, you know, pitching, you know, lactic acid bacteria, like, like lactobacillus into right. uh, unpitched uh, wort, letting it ferment for you know, 48 hours to kind of create uh, lactic acid and then um, killing off that bacteria and then pitching a brewer's yeast uh, to ferment out that, that beer. So you have, you know, a nice soft, if it goes well, a nice soft acidity. Um, what we do is, 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 is very different than that. And, and again, you know, that's my whole thing is transparency. I, there's no right or wrong. There's just transparency when it comes to beer making. Uh, it's all so subjective. So, you know, that kind of quick souring approach is, 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 is fine. Um, it's not what we're passionate about. It's not what we do at Jester King. You know, we allow, um, microbes that we harvest from the land and the air around the brewery to slowly ferment out sugars in the wort over long periods of time where the interactions of the different yeasts and bacteria coupled with time have the potential to create just new and interesting flavors that we could not really come up with uh, intentionally. It's, it's really like seeding control. Like we are just along for the ride and the yeast and bacteria create flavors that, like I mentioned, otherwise we couldn't have, you know, kind of put together on our own, which, which I think is where some of the magic lies. And ultimately some of the just fascinating experiences with beer can, can arise from, um, you know, anything from like just, you know, crazy you know, tropical fruit flavors to weird, like funky barnyardy flavors. Oh to, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then when it comes to, to sour, um, because there is bacteria in the fermentation, we do see, you know, acidity. Um, although one thing I would, you know, point out with us is we're not after acidity just for the sake of acidity. I mean, yeah, you know, just something that's gonna like clench your face up just for the sake of being sour. Yeah, that's 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 right. kind of one dimensional, and I don't think very fun. I mean, you know, you know, you're you're a chef, so I mean, you know, when you create dishes, you know, maybe you're looking for like an acid component that is complementary to a more complex whole. Right, and so I think that that analogy works for for brewing and 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 uh, blending because we'll take beer that's been matured in oak barrels for anywhere from one to three years, and then blend those together to create something that's cohesive, where it's not just like puckeringly sour, like, uh, well, I'm, okay, I tasted that, but I'm good now. Uh, you know, ultimately, you know, whether you're making barley wine or mild or sour beer, whatever it may be, I think the beer has to be drinkable, meaning that you have one glass and you're like, oh, I'd be glad to have another. Um, right. So that's why I never really refer to our beer as, you know, sour beer. Not, not that it like offends me or anything, but that's just not quite true to what we're after. Yeah, it, there's a couple things to unpack there that I think are interesting. One is it's just such a challenge. I have a bone to pick with the market value, the perceived value in the market for those products because sour beer then has now an expectation in the market. And there's a challenge there because a beer that takes seven to 10 days to produce and a beer that takes three years to produce cannot be on par, yet they get lumped into sour beer, which is why I wanted you to unpack that a little bit. So I think that's important. Understand the product, the process, right? The ingredients is so, so important. If you fancy yourself a craft beer nerd, like so many of us do, understanding that is important. If I just want, you know, something sour, I, I fine. That That's okay too. Absolutely. It has a place, yet I'm not willing to pay 
for that. I'm willing to pay for it on the other side of that equation. Incremental value, I think, is important to understand in that. And so with that, then the other part of it, I equate it in the culinary side uh, to, to fermenting or pickling. I love pickles, yet they're, they're very one note in the acidity. You taste acetobacter. You taste acetic acid. That's it, right? And that's good. That's pleasing. And I like the cucumbers and the spices and all those other things. Great. That has a place. And then fermenting, you're also going to have acidity, yet you're going to have this lactic acidity. You're going to have this complexity to it. You're going to have that sodium is going to create layers and layers upon layers of flavor and fermentation amplifies Things taste sometimes, cabbage can taste more like cabbage because you fermented them. That's what I think of when you do what you do, right? A, pick, a cucumber doesn't taste more like a cucumber when you pickle it, but cabbage tastes more like cabbage when you turn it into sauerkraut. There's an interesting dynamic that happens. So I'm going down rabbit holes, but I want people to understand there is a difference and it's important to understand that difference. So the culinary aspect is important. I want to taste some beer. I'm very excited about this to have a couple of beers that uh, you actually gave to me i looked at the date 2015 when you and i first met came down to austin texas we launched brood food our you know year on year national tour of doing crazy shit between combining beer and food and we started a mother for our kimchi that started with harvesting some yeast from your beers right so we took the methodology of like we're going to create mixed culture fermentation we're going to capture wild yeasts we're actually going to let jeff and his team do all the work and then we're going to take it from inside of these bottles so very cool unique thing and i've been sitting on these in the cellar buddy i'm excited <laughs> to crack these open so tell people what i'll be drinking the beer de blanc de bois which is beautiful yeah, this is, um uh, a barrel aged uh, wild beer, just native yeast and bacteria, that, like we talked about from our ranch here at Jester King. Um, the beer was aged in neutral oak barrels for about 18 months. Uh, we created a blend and then we waited for uh, the 2015 harvest to come along. Um, our harvest, wine grape harvest, is in August, um, typically. And uh, blank Wow, because it's still hot there? Uh, yes, it's, um, you know, typically highs in the hundreds around that time. Uh, Blanc du Bois is a, a grape that we grow here at Jester King. Our vines are not mature and we're not harvesting from them. They're only about two years old, but, um, Blanc du Bois does well in this environment. It's typically grown in, uh, Spain and, 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 um, uh, uh, Portugal kind of, you know, warmer weather drought, uh, places with like high temperatures and drought. So it does well in an environment like Texas. It's uh, resistant to floroc, flor I can never say that word right, uh, floroxera. Um, ba basically it, it's a hardy grape that it can fight disease well. And um, I think it has beautiful flavors. I get kind of like, you know, kind of like a honeysuckle, uh, cotton candy vibe out of it a little bit. Um, and um, yeah, so we just added, uh, we just crushed these some of the grapes, uh, racked uh, the, wild beer on top of it and then let a let a re-fermentation occur um our cultures tr take things to total dryness there's like just no residual Bone sugar dry. at this point yeah. yeah um and then i i think that um well scientifically you know I, I i'm a little weak on this but i feel that like you know wild yeast has the ability to scavenge oxygen and keep beers presenting relatively fresh you know years down the road like you know a nice right. Poppy pale ale, that's going to degrade, you know, within even just like a month. Um, whereas like a wild beer like this, that's more, that has natural acidity and, you know, wild yeast, um, it's going to stand up to time pretty well. You know, again, drawing an analogy to the wine world, um, you know, this beer is very much kind of a hybrid of beer and wine. And, um, you know, I haven't opened a, a 2015 version of that anytime recently, but um, yeah, how's, how's it holding up? I was about to say, let me tell you about it, Jeff. Let me tell you, <laughs> honeysuckle, literally the first thing on the nose is absolutely that kind of wildflower honeysuckle, a little bit of green grass in there, which I think is, is super pleasing. On the palate, the carbonation holds up. This is what I'm always concerned laying down. Some of them will, will have gushers for sure. So I actually did downstairs just crack just to make sure that I literally didn't have a gusher on, on with you. Uh, right. but it, it held it nice, super tight bubbles, right? So I think of like riddling in champagne, you're looking for those really, really tight bubbles where they keep cascading. So when I'm looking at this, I have 
bubbles covering the entire bottom of it and you see some continuing to pop up to the top so the composition of it really really good we're getting nerdy people all right like this is this is our time we need to geek out on beer here the other thing is bone bone dry like it pulls at your tongue a little bit it's so dry which i think is really really good uh if there was residual sweetness i think it'd get a little cloying and then it would start to taste too much like honey and then i think it goes in a completely different direction there's also just enough acidity right and i think what i like about a beer like this and beers with that perceivable acid that titratable acid i think is important because it makes it great with food to go to wine like you're talking about when you pair to wine you're pairing to acidity you're yes. always trying to like match and balance out that acidity because the acidity brightens up the palate a little bit it cleans it up especially with with meats and fats that reset your palate for another bite this is super important when you're thinking about this if you want to be dynamic create a place of beer have food be on uh tap lists at your, your local restaurants if your beer is better with food you have more versatility and i think you can sell more beer i i truly yeah. truly believe that and i know that's super important to you uh this is really drinkable right now oh good good i was you have beer down for five years you hope but We've we've definitely dumped some down the sink. We know it's like it's a crapshoot, right? Um, yeah, do you get a little bit of oxidation? Uh, sometimes you know, after five years, I'll get a little bit of oxidative note. Yeah, uh, a touch, but I think because of the carbonation, it cleans it up. So it doesn't sometimes oxidized characteristics like sit on the on the roof of my mouth a little bit and like just kind of linger. I think because of the carbonation, it cleans it up really quickly. So yes, I do get oxidized, but it doesn't linger, which I think is super important. So. I really appreciate that. Uh, for you, again, an agricultural, we started at the top of this talking about farm to bottle, where you're thinking about your farm, your ingredients, the goats, the Colorado, uh, excuse me, Colorado. I'm in Colorado. The Texas grapes, I think, are important to you, that agricultural product. What does it mean for you also to kind of be a steward for those ingredients? Now you have a pretty big platform, Jeff, right? And you're introducing people to, I didn't know that there was grapes grown in Texas until I had some of your beers. I was like, I get it. Like I understand yeah. that ingredient now. Being a steward for the land and for somebody like grape growers in Texas, what does that represent to you? Oh yeah, um, I mean, we're, we're excited just to be kind of dipping our toe into, you know, winemaking and uh, grape growing and, um, you know, kind of, uh, making connect, we've made connections in the last several years with our local winemakers, and oftentimes, just given our techniques and approaches to beer, feel we have more in common with our local winemakers at times than our local uh, brewers. Right, and, makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, I, even though we're not officially winemakers yet, even though we have aspirations to, to do that as well as con to continue to make hybrids of beer and wine, um, yeah, it does it does still mean something to represent our, our, our region. And, um, and, and it's not so much that I'm, you know, it's, I have this like real, like, you know, uh, attitude of like, Oh, Texas is going to be the best or, or whatever. It's, it's far from that. It, it's more like, let's just demonstrate that we have something unique here that's, yeah. that's specific to us that is worthy of, of experiencing. And, and if it recognition comes with that, then, then, then great. But um, like yeah, that. we just want to represent uh, the Hill country. I mean, we've, we're a brewery that you know loves to do collaborations all over the world and go to beer festivals and make connections. But ultimately, like what we do is pretty simple in many ways. Like, you know, when it comes to recipe creativity, it's you know very much like you know a, a chef might approach um, uh, you know a, a dish by just going and seeing you know what's in season, what's what's good, what's what's here, and then just kind of staying out of the way. Um, you know, we try to create good cohesive blends, but like. We're, our recipes are pretty simple. Um, like time and patience is just key to what we do. And then ultimately having the palate discipline to, you know, not blend something that didn't work out. And so. Yes. And the financial time. resolve to do that. That's a challenge when you're like, we're, we have to dump 50 barrels of beer. That's money and a lot yeah. of time and a lot of heart and soul and, to have the time, the patience, it's something, especially again, in food, beverage, hospitality, we're not good at patience. We're very yeah. instant gratification. So I really appreciate that. And you've really instilled that in your team. It's very much a part of your culture there. Everyone is very bought into that. And that's a huge challenge. So I really, really appreciate that. All right. One more beer before we let you go. Uh, 
The name of your designer, who's one of the best in the game, period. Who, who is it that designs your labels? His name is uh, Joshua Cockrell. He has been with us since day one. Uh, he, uh, he has a, uh, uh, an assistant now named Katie Ross. So some of the, uh, art that, uh, you see now is, uh, you know, products of Katie and Josh combined, but up until that point, you know, he's responsible for every single little piece of our branding from, you know, start to finish day, day one. You guys um, have a really unique concept when it comes to branding that I think is important. Look at that color. Come on. Beautiful carbonation again. Really, really like that is you guys can have you know, one design that looks death metal, another that looks like uh, turn of the century Parisian, right? completely stylistically different, completely different color tones, yet they all feel very Jester King. And this is something super unique that I think a lot of people in food and beverage, we always put out the same image thinking that that's consistency. You guys are very diverse. You have a very unique eclectic style. And no matter what, I see a label of yours and it screams Jester King, even if it's all black death metal or one has like pink poppies on it. Like they look this, they they look like Jester King. So I really appreciate that. And, and this design is another one. But tell people what I'm drinking here because this is a beauty. Yeah. So this this beer is um, another wine influenced beer. Um, it's called Detritivore. Um, essentially, we take the the spent fruit from one beer and use it to make another. So. Uh, if, you know, if any you know wine makers or aficionados are, are listening, you may have heard of like Paquette, which yep. is you know you take uh, the grapes from you know, from pressing throughout the the, the the harvest season and just steep them, steep some water on top of them, where you're extracting some of the residual flavor from the grapes after they've already been pressed. Um, in this case, uh, well, not grapes. Uh, we took cherries from a beer that we make. Um, a wild beer that we re-ferment with uh, Montmorency and Balaton cherries. And then we take just a really, really simple, not water, but a really just simple, basic wort, you know, unfermented beer. Rack that, transfer that on top of the cherries and just let them steep. So just kind of you're picking up whatever residual flavor and aroma is left from the cherries after they've already been uh, fermented one time. So essentially taking the, you know, the what's left over from one beer to, to make another, which, um, you know, again, is a technique that winemakers have been doing for forever. Yeah. Um, you know, Brasserie Cantillon in Brussels, Belgium, you know, uh, and talking to them, like, you know, throughout the decades, um, you know, they would, especially when times were tough in like the seventies and the eighties, when Lambic almost became extinct, you know, just right. to stretch their dollars, they would, you know, use fruit multiple times. And that was part of our inspiration as well. So more of kind of like a subtle character. It's not going to be like big, bold, jammy in your face. And you can just tell by the, the, the color there. And it's kind of that light pink, not that kind of like deep uh, ruby red, um, you know, from the cherries. And um, we also use a little bit of uh, aged hops in that that beer, which I think you know, draws in the connection to Lambic a little bit more. We yep. get some of that kind of, kind of earthy, funky, barnyardy character. Um, so yeah, kind of equal, equal parts Lambic inspired and equal parts, uh, Paquette inspired. Both these 2015s have, have held up a little more oxidation, uh, on this guy. And I think from, um, uh, from fruit, you'll, uh, fruit, like a cherry, I'd expect that even a little bit more than, than grape, just the dynamic of that and the, the bricks of that on the onset. But what I really like is, is a couple things that you just mentioned that I think are important. <laughs> Necessity is the mother of all invention, right? You create a whole new style of being able to re-ferment used spent fruit because you had to stretch that dollar. You had to make another beer that creates this very uniquely elegant style because sometimes those highly extracted jammy stuff, I love them for five, six, seven sips. I don't want another one because they're intense, right? They're very, yeah. very intense. They A lot of palate fatigue. This is very quaffable, very drinkable. There's, there's this level of minerality on it. And then I get a little of that cheesiness, which I really like. It makes it very umami. And you've sent me giant trash bags of your guys's two, three, four year old hops. And they're funky and dirty and grimy and cheesy. And I really like the depth because sometimes if it tastes like Welch's fruit juice, I'm not into it. I want seeds and stems and, you know, the moldy ones that hit the ground from the orchard. Like that sense of, of place is something that you've done really well. I think of uh, this one's a good representation. What's the strawberry beer that you have that 25% of the strawberries leave the tops on? 
Oh yeah, it's called uh, Omniscience and Proselytism. That, if I could only pronounce all the names of your beers, that is just the essence of it. Leaving the stems on the strawberries, right? Creating that level of character, I think, is something super, super important. These are great. I'm really, I'm really excited about that. I actually told my neighbors, I was like, "Hey, you're gonna be getting some Jester King beer because I'm gonna pour you guys some some midday beers. So just be ready." I really appreciate these. Any last thoughts for us as we have a highly professional brewer and restaurant people, kind of people that get this, but it's time for us to kind of move beyond what's in the glass. And I think you've spoken that. Any last thoughts you can take us out? Great episode. Great talk, Jeff. Appreciate oh, it. Thank you, Jensen. Um, yeah, I, I think just, um, you know, in, 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 in these times, I'll kind of loop back around to the you know, one of the beginning topics we talked about is, you um, you know, just in terms of, uh, of of creating community, we've also, I think one thing that craft brewers have been forced to do, and I say I, I forced makes it sound like it's a negative, far from it, is that, you know, we've actually now started to pay attention to like service and hospitality like we never have yes. before, where, you know, it needs to be a great experience, but then it has to be accompanied by, you know, skilled, you know, hospitality professionals who know how to, uh, you know, pr provide education as well as an exceptional experience to folks. And, you um, you know, we were, I think we were chatting online a few months ago about, you know, some of our influences and we're talking about like, you know, some of the Danny Meyer stuff and, mm. and um, yeah, just like, that's just another piece of the, of the puzzle. So I feel it's like brewers, I think maybe a theme for our discussion today is like we as brewers are simultaneously pulled these days towards chefs and restaurateurs as well as winemakers. So in part of being more total, more total in our experience, like we feel like we're adopting new hats, and and I think that's great. I think ultimately that's great for people's experience and great for for culture in general. I could not agree more. I think now in in troubled times, we see gathering around the table, around a plate, around a glass, around a bottle. It, it really matters matters fundamentally, and so taking on that opportunity and responsibility as a brewer elevates the position that you have in that community and thereby your opportunity and again responsibility to deliver on what that means to be at the epicenter of any given community i think it's super important so jeff i really appreciate this and this is funny i thought this when we first got on to our buddy jeff hey jeffrey you freezing down there or what i know <laughs> it's, it's not even uh you know halloween yet and it's like 36 degrees out here uh which uh, I'm not used to. So uh, we're supposed to be back in the 70s by the weekend, thankfully. Right. Uh, Jeff, of course, brewer, owner, very talented in, in mixed culture as well at Adam in uh, in Colorado. And uh, yeah, we got snow on the ground right now here. So Jeff, Jeffrey Stuffings, everybody. So greatly appreciate the conversation. Appreciate the guidance and leadership you've always shown and, and, uh, and mentorship. I've learned so much about beer, so much about food, so much about myself myself as a, as a chef in diving in and interacting with you. And I think that level of relationship is what this is all about. So I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you, Jensen. Always great to talk to you and you do amazing work. So uh, thank you for carrying on the torch during these, these COVID times. Yes, sir. Jeffrey Stuffings, everyone. You have a great rest of your day. Keep warm, my friend. All right. You too, Jensen. Great to see you, man. Cheers. Cheers. All right, everybody. Jeffrey Stuffings, really somebody that thinks about beer, thinks about community in a very unique way. We didn't even touch on it. They're on some, what, 40, 50 acres of preserved land as well. Just important to be a steward for that community, defining your community and being immersed in it, telling that story. That's what matters. And again, that's why nobody else can ever recreate a Jeff Stuffings, a Jester King experience or even beer because so uniquely them, that's what every single brand in beer and anything needs to be thinking about figuring out how to do because otherwise you become chummed up in the white noise, the minutia, the commoditization of any given product. That's what's important. That's what I appreciate Jeff for uh, these beers, 2015 beers, drinking amazing. I am excited about these because they are just such true representations of everything we just talked about. That is it for this episode. Uh, next week, Peter Kylie from Monday Night Brewing is going to be on a part of this five-part series of Best Served Chilled, where we're kind of scouring the country for unique stories, people that are leading, emerging, that are telling stories, because you know that that's what we're all about here at Best Served. Thank you all, as always, for tuning in. Cheers. <laughs>